Several of you have asked me if I'm sore from playing basketball this afternoon. And I can say that I'm not. My face is red and I can feel it, okay? But I'm so old, it's going to take my muscles about 48 hours to communicate signals up to my brain that I did something that I shouldn't have done. But I can say this, I watched more than I played. I saw guys 20 and 30 years younger than me fly over me, make some layups and get some rebounds, and I got to throw the ball in a few times. It was great. <clears throat> One time I hit a three, and the guy on my team said, good shot, don't try that again. <laughs> I am not lying. It was, <laughs> it was funny, though. It was great. But my team won most of the time um, because I had the right guys on my side. All of the old dudes. So we proved once again that old guys rule. <laughs> okay, I need to make a transition, don't I? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and uh, the fact that we can sing songs that reflect your word and encourage one another by this. We pray now that the explanation of the Lord's Supper as a means of grace would be cleared up by you, and uh, you would bless your word to the well-being and benefit of all the souls here tonight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Um, the Lord's Supper is a means of grace is the second title um, allotted to me. So I, I didn't ask for this. This is what I was given. I think one of the reasons why I was given this is because I had the privilege of addressing the ARPCA General Assembly in 2011 at La Mirada on the same subject. If you're expecting to hear that sermon again tonight, I'm not going to do it. If you'd like to hear that sermon, which was a sermon more like a lecture to 120 pastors, okay? So, and at the time I was teaching at a seminary and they gave me like six or eight months to uh, prepare for it. So I had like five or 50 sermons in my head uh, when I was addressing those men. And so I preached it at a high level on purpose, okay? So I'm not going to redo that sermon here. What I did with that, that lecture at our own church is I turned it into five or six sermons um, to our people, and, and um, you can listen to that message on the ARBCA website for the 2011 GA, or you can listen to four or five or six sermons at our church's website, www.grbcav.org. Um, the sermons are there. You just press on sermons, it takes you to sermon audio, or you can just go to sermon audio. So what was I going to do? Um, last summer, after I preached those five or six sermons, I said to myself, Self, it's taken you a long time to come to these conclusions. I think I can show you from the Bible, I can certainly show you from historical theology, that uh, the Protestant church, the, the 1689 confession is clear, the particular Baptists of the 17th century are clear, they weren't mere memorialists, that the Lord's Supper is just something that we uh, do together and it's more horizontal, we corporately remember something back uh, in the history of redemption, the most crucial as aspect of our redemption, the death of Christ. Um, all, it is that, but it's more than that. It's more than a memory. Uh, so I told myself, soul, you've got to write a book. So I wrote a book on this subject. So it's not, it's not fair that I'm given 45 to 60 minutes. And I just wanted to say that, okay? It, I feel cheated, right? Like, I need more time on this subject. Uh, and I feel sorry for you because um, I got a lot in me, okay? So what do you do? Do you deal with, just real practically, um, what, uh, when should the church, or how often should the church take the Lord's Supper? That's a very practical issue. Um, I think often. That's what the Bible said, as, as often as you take. And, um, or you could deal with... Uh, who should take the Lord's Supper? It's a very practical issue. You could deal with that. I'm not going to deal with that. Um, or you could go back to the title that was allotted to me. The Lord's Supper as a means of grace. So, okay, the Lord's Supper is when the church gathers. Christ ordained this memorial meal, this covenantal meal um, for his disciples. 
When they gather as a church, they are, one of the things they are to do is they are to set aside bread and, and, and uh, wine, and the bread symbolizes the crushed body of our Lord, and the wine symbolizes the shed blood, and in the pr- pursuit of the inauguration of the new covenant, and it's to be a time of rejoicing and all that stuff. Um, this message is the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. So what I'm going to try to do is try to go to the text, I think, in the New Testament that's clearest, uh, clearly at least assumes, I think it also teaches, but it more, even more so just assumes that the Lord's Supper is a means whereby grace from heaven gets to us, uh, soul-altering grace, soul-changing grace, help from Christ gets to our souls, one of the delivery systems being the cup of blessing, the bread that we break. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is the passage I'm thinking of, so I want you to turn there. I think it's very interesting, very, very interesting, that uh, verse 16 is used or cited in um, most of the Protestant and certainly all the Reformed confessions and catechisms when they start talking about the uh, Lord's Supper, when there's a doctrinal formulation made by one of the confessions. They all cite 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Now, 1 Corinthians 10:16 says this, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Uh, The New American Standard says sharing. The King James, New King James, communion. Okay, so that's where we get uh, holy communion from. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 16. We call it the communion service. Your church might call it that sometimes, which is very interesting. Uh, It's a service where communion takes place. And one of the questions I would have is, who do you think serves at the communion service? We usually think, well, the pastors and the deacons. Well, yeah, they do. But who gives us grace at communion? See, even the, the name communion and communion service, that phrase implies something about what's taking place there, sometimes that we don't even think about. We get that language from this text, from the King James uh, Version primarily, communion. But what's interesting is 1 Corinthians 10.16 is in a passage that's not dealing explicitly about the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11 is a lot clearer. It deals with a lot of the horizontal issues that were a problem with the Corinthian church there. But he's dealing with another issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Matter of fact, you can go up to verse 14 uh, and you can see your English version probably has a beginning of a paragraph there. Here's what he's dealing with. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So he's dealing with idolatry. And so I'm going to prove to you that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace from the context of Paul's letter to the uh, Corinthians in the 10th chapter in the 16th verse in the context of idolatry. It's a kind of a Weird place. Why would, he, why would he say this? I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? He assumes that, uh, an affirmative answer to both questions and that they knew that. Well, of course, the Lord's Supper has involves communion in the blood of Christ and in the body of Christ. Of course it does. So he's using something about the nature of the Lord's Supper in the, uh, in the context of idolatry to prove to them that idolatry, and I think more so, uh, sharing or having communion at pagan ritual services and eating the food offered to idols is a form of idolatry that they are, they are, that they are to flee. And he uses the Lord's Supper in a way... Uh, these rhetorical questions, assuming, yeah, you guys know that when you take the Lord's Supper, it's more than just we're eating bread and wine and we happen to all be Christians. It's more than just something horizontal taking place. Something actually, your souls get tinkered with, okay? And it's God who's doing it at the supper. And then he goes and says, that's why you can't have the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Because something happens, you become sharers, as we're going to look at, he says in the context, sharers of demons and with demons. You have communion 
with them at some level in some way. There's a lot of stuff I can't tell you, but there is one thing I believe that Paul is using the Lord's Supper, assuming it as a means of grace, that his audience knew that it was more of a something vertical happens when we take the Lord's Supper, and then he goes, something vertical also happens when you mess around with, with uh, the idolatry that transpires at uh, pagan ritual feasts and festivals. So that's what's happening, I think, here. I'm not the only one that thinks that. But once you, it would be, by the way, if I was the only one, if I came up here and said, hey, none of the commentaries saw this. You should just say, none, none. You know, I puffed up my chest, none. If I was you, good golly, you know, be nice about it or just say, uh, David or Pastor Drizzo or no commentators hold this view? Okay, I can say that a lot of commentators hold this view, okay? That uh, Paul assumes this and then applies it to the idolatry that was taking place unwittingly by the Christians in Corinth. Now, let me try to, try to show you that, the context. It actually starts, this section actually starts in, in chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Okay? Several times in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, now concerning, now concerning, now concerning. He's probably answering some issues, some questions that they had. He's certainly dealing with a lot of separate practical things. But in 8.1, he begins dealing with things sacrificed to idols. And even more so, in 8.4, he says, eating of things sacrificed to idols. Okay? This section, I think, ends at 11.1. So it goes from 8.1 through 11.1. One. Um, one of the commentaries that I read, the guy said this, a cosmopolitan city, Corinth, was a religious melting pot with older and newer religious flourish, religions flourishing side by side. Most persons could accommodate all gods and goddesses into their religious behavior, and they could choose from a great cafeteria line of religious practices. The Christian confession of one God and one Lord, however, requires exclusive loyalty to God as Father and Christ as Lord. So Paul is arguing against the Corinthians' participation in the religious syncretism so common in Corinth in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And in the process of doing that, he, several practical matters come to the surface which we'll see below. Now, our section that we're going to deal with is verses 14 through 22. Okay, let me read that section, and then I'll kind of explain the section before it, chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, and then the section after it, chapter 10, verses 23 through the end of the passage, and then we'll look at verse 16. So let's listen to 14 through 16. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. Okay, so the, the therefore is connected with the passage before. The old covenant Israelites were a bad example. Some of them fell into idolatry. And he says, uh, don't imitate them. Flee idolatry. I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup... Now he's going to get into idolatry. But before he does that, he says, hey, you guys know about the nature of the supper as a means of grace. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing, a communion of the, of the blood of Christ? Yes. Is not the bread which we break a communion of the body of Christ? Yes. Since there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to, to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, okay? So he's talking about idolatry here, and I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than He, are we? So I think what that section is dealing with is idolatry, verse 14, and then we'll deal with it a little more. But verses 1 through 10 is the passage right before it. It's obviously connected because he says, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, Paul refers, as I said before, to ancient Israel as an example 
of privileged people abusing their privileges. That's the first five verses. And committing idolatry, verse 7. And in light of this, he exhorts the Corinthians to flee from their bad, uh, excuse me, learn from their bad example, not crave evil things, verse 6, to avoid idolatry, verse 7, to avoid immorality, verse 8, to avoid trying the Lord and grumbling. He admonishes them to learn from ancient Israel, take heed and be reminded of the faithfulness of God in the midst of temptations. Now, isn't it, isn't it interesting? We, most of us, or many of us, probably, you, you memorize 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I can remember as a new Christian driving a, my ranch truck in central California, slamming the, uh, my fist on the, on the dashboard, quoting 1 Corinthians 10, 13, because I didn't want certain thoughts in my heads, you know, head, you know? Uh, no temptation has overtaken me, but such as is common to everybody else. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And it's true. We should quote that and use it. But notice the next word. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. What's the specific contextual temptation that these people were under? It's religious syncretism. Okay? Being a Christian and involving themselves in pagan uh, ritual worship, uh, issues of ritual worship. And he says, you can't do that. And now later, after he deals with idolatry in verses 14 through 22, he goes on in, in, in the next section that starts in chapter uh, 10, verse 23. And there he deals with eating meat sold in the market, like 10, verse 25. Though they are free to eat such meat, this is not idolatry now. Okay, this is something indifferent. This is not the moral law of God. This is something that under certain circumstances, you're free to do it. Uh, but there are times it is best not to for conscience sake, whether that's their own conscience or the conscience of others. I'll let your pastors tell you. Whatever they do, they are to make sure it is not seeking their own good, verse 24, and it is done to the glory of God, verse 31, and it is giving offense, no offense to unconverted Jews, unconverted Greeks, or the church of God, verse 32. Now, it's very important that you see the transition in verse 23 of chapter 10 from the moral law to things indifferent, from idolatry to things that they could or don't have to, may or might participate in, depending on the circumstances in which they lived. Okay? He doesn't fl say, flee meat offered to idols that sold in the marketplaces. He doesn't say that. He says, flee idolatry. And then he talks about, uh, then he talks about being sharers with demons and, and uh, sharers in the altar and, and something that's obviously different than food offered to idols sold in the public marketplace that one of your neighbors might buy and I ask you over for dinner on Thursday night. That's way different than, therefore, beloved, flee idolatry. Okay? That's very important, I, I think, to see that. And others uh, think so as well. For instance, somebody said this, Paul discusses a variety of contexts in which food might be eaten as part of a pagan religious meal. 14 and following. Food purchased in the market for eating at home. Verses 25 and 26. Food that one is offered when eating uh, as a guest in another's home, verses 27 through 30. And he gives advice for each context. That's the uh, preceding and the succeeding context of our passage, verses 14 through 22. Now, there's no way, okay, I'm going to take you through all those verses. Big sigh of relief, right? We ate chicken and then had sweets afterwards, and so we're all tired. And uh, a very technical subject has been given to me. So uh, I'm not going to go through the entire uh, passage. I did read the passage. I want to focus on uh, verse 16, as I said before, because that's, that's the text that gives rise to the communion service. You know, Holy Communion. And it's cited in all the, the uh, Protestant and Reformed confessions and catechisms. And I think Paul assumes... Um, and very clearly that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace here. And hopefully you can see that more because I set it in its context. Now this section deals with idolatry. Paul says it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 
So this isn't an indifferent matter. This isn't an issue of conscience. Well, you know, you're free to. Um, but you're free not to. You're not free to do whatever he's talking about in this passage. Having mentioned the fact of the idolatry of some in ancient Israel, chapter 10, verse 7, he now deals with contemporary idolatry in the context of church members at Corinth. They were committing idolatry and didn't realize it. Maybe they did realize it and he was confronting them on it. Possibly they didn't realize it. I already read the entire passage for you. And I think this passage brings up many questions of which I will not answer all of them. But I'll answer a few of them. I think the ones that are the most important to the subject tonight, and that is the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. This much seems clear so far. In 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with several church problems, one of them being idolatry, 10.14. Apparently, some Christians thought they were free to continue participating in pagan sacrificial meals. Most commentators believe that's what the background here. They were participating in pagan sacrificial meals, possibly and most likely, I think, at pagan places of sacrifice, pagan temples, very common uh, in that day. And they just continued doing that, not thinking theologically as new Christians, and Paul confronts them on it. He strongly disagreed with them that they could continue in this because he says, Therefore, my my beloved, flee from idolatry. So he's combating the sin of idolatry committed by some of the uh, Corinthians by their participating in pagan religious meals. And he does it pastorally, but he assumes that they know they have a distinct theology of the Lord's Supper. The way he asks this question, again, assumes a yes answer. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a communion of the blood of Christ or a sharing in the blood of Christ? Well, yes. Is not the bread which we break a sharing or communion in the body of Christ? The answer is yes. And he says, well, look, there's also sharing with demons. There's some sort of way that contact that... Uh, 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 something your soul is affected in an adverse way by demons when you participate in those kinds of pagan uh, religious rituals. You are not to do that. So the nature of the Lord's Supper, I think, is taken up by Paul here, and it's seen primarily by this these phrases. Like okay, you have a noun, which my New American Standard um, translates sharing. Okay, the Greek word there, and you've heard this before, is koinonia. Okay, sometimes translated fellowship, sometimes translated sharing, sometimes translated communion. That's a very important word. We've got to figure out what that word means in this text, in this context. But that word is modified by, uh, by two uh, phrases. Notice, it's not the cup of blessing which we bless a communion, a sharing in the blood of Christ. We've got to figure out what that means. What does it mean that the Lord's Supper is a sharing in or of the blood of Christ? Do we drink Christ's physical blood? Which is a good question. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in or of, some of the versions, the body of Christ? Communion in the blood of Christ. Communion in the body of Christ. We've got to figure out what those things mean. So, what does koinonia, what does this word translated um, sharing in the New American Standard here, what does it mean in this text? Okay. Now, here's what we don't do. We don't go, go say, okay, let's go to a Greek dictionary. We open it up, and it has like 19 different options, and you just pick the one you like the best. That's what it means. Okay. Uh, quite often, that's what we do. Um, when you go to a Greek dictionary, just like an English dictionary, it'll give you a, different, a bunch of different options, okay? And you don't sit there going, wow, so many options, I can't make a choice. This is terrible. You know, you start pulling out your hair. Uh, I need some coffee or whatever. Whatever you drink to mellow you out. When, when you go to a Greek dictionary and they give you all these options, it's because the word 
can have a diff some different flavors to it, okay? Various nuances. And words always take on their meaning based on their use in context, okay? So we have to figure out what this word means here, not what it might mean someplace else. Because it's koinonia, uh, at least as American evangelicals, in my thinking, our immediate response is going to be something horizontal. Well, it means that we are all sharing something. Does it always mean that? Does it always have a horizontal aspect to it? Or could communion or fellowship have a vertical aspect to it? And which does it have here? Now, the Lord's Supper. Does the Lord's Supper, is there anything horizontal about the Lord's Supper? Yeah. We are doing it, okay? We are partaking of the, wine, of the bread and the wine. And local churches do that, okay? So that, there's horizontal stuff, and 1 Corinthians 11 deals with a lot of the horizontal problems that were going on in, in Corinth with the Lord's Supper. But simply because the Lord's Supper has to do with horizontal things doesn't mean necessar necessarily that every time it's brought up, that's what the author's talking about. And this is one of those places where I'm prepared to say, he's not talking about this, that we are doing something. He's talking about the nature of this communion, that it actually affects our souls. And our souls are affected through this as a means, ultimately, by Christ sending his spirit to bless us. Um, and because there's a sharing that goes on there with with the benefits of redemption, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, because of that, um, there's also something that goes on when you mess, at, mess around at, at pagan ritual uh, religious festivals. Okay? Something's going on. There's demons active there. And, and you, you somehow share with them as well. That, I think that's what he's saying here. Now this word is used um, in many places in the New Testament. Uh, this word sharing or koinonia or uh, fellowship or communion. And it's used in 1 Corinthians 1.9, and I want you to turn there. This is important. When, when you're trying to define a word and its meaning and context, of course, you, you want to look at the context, but one of the things you want to do is, as well is uh, see if the author uses the word elsewhere. And he uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, uh, beginning uh, or there, uh, there in verse 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into... Now, it's interesting here the New American Standard translates it, fellowship with each other. Did anyone catch that? The preacher misread the Bible. I didn't read the Bible accurately there. It says, fellowship with His Son. Now, this is a you plural. We're called into fellowship. So, he's talking to all the saints there. Okay? You all have something in common. Every single one of you as an individual have been called by God into fellowship with His Son who's exalted at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And you can go read all the commentaries and see them fight over whether or not this is horizontal or vertical. I think it's clearly vertical. Okay? He's talking about what a corporate body as individuals have with Christ. They have fellowship with Christ. They have, they have communion with Christ. They're, they're connected with Christ. They're in union with Christ. They get the benefits of Christ's life and uh, unto death, uh, obedience and resurrection. They get it because they're connected to Him. Okay? It's a top-down kind, of kind, of uh, kind of a perspective here. And that's exactly what uh, one commentator says. He says, normally... In Paul, the word means communal participation in that of which all participants are shareholders and are accorded a common share. It is not simply or primarily the experience of being together as Christians, which is shared. That's not what he's talking about. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, into sharing with His Son. You have a, an apportioned lot in your soul and for you because you're connected with His Son. But the status here is the status of being in Christ and of being shareholders in the things of Christ or shareholders in that which we get from Christ. In other words, salvation and everything that entails. 
So note that the fellowship here in 1 Corinthians 1.9 is with God's Son and not with each other. That's not the, the, the emphasis there. And I think coming back to 1 Corinthians 10.16, it's the same emphasis. If you read this in context, Paul is going to use this concept of, of being connected to the benefits, I think, of Christ's uh, uh, redemption, the benefits of his death and resurrection for us, He's going to say that there's an analogy between that and participating in pagan, ritual, religious, sacrificial meals. Because we, we're actually sharing in the benefits of Christ. They're actually sharing in the something that demons do. You read most of the, com- all the commentators at some point stop and go, I don't know what he's talking about as far as the nature of it, okay? But we do know this much. Something's going on there in, that pa- in those pagan uh, uh, rituals that Paul says, that's idolatry, stop it. And something goes on in the Lord's Supper that puts us in connection with Christ that he assumes they already knew that yes, that's what happens. And because that's what happens, and this is similar uh, to it, he says, stop the one, of course, continue the other. So this is a vertical communion that he's talking about here. This isn't a horizontal communion. Paul says, oh, don't be at the pagan rituals uh, because there's pagans there. And any place pagans are, Christians should not be. That's not his argument. His argument is, this is there's, there's a vertical top-down thing that happens at the Lord's Supper, right? You have communion with the exalted Lord Jesus. The Spirit of God blesses the means ordained by God and brings redemptive benefits to your souls through the Lord's Supper. Your souls get altered. Your souls get tinkered, don't, tinkered with, don't they? Well, Satan's tried to do something similar to it. It's called pagan ritual uh, uh, religious festivals. And don't be a part of that stuff. That stuff's idolatry. Flee that. So I think that's what's happening here. And I've already let the cat out of the bag in terms of these phrases. The blood of Christ and the body of Christ. Uh, excuse me, the blood of Christ. Uh, yeah, the body, blood of Christ and the blo- body of Christ. Do we actually drink Christ's physical blood? Did you know that the Lord Jesus was a man? Okay? A body and soul. A real bonafide image bearer of God and he had a limited amount of blood. Is that right, Pastor Ron? Okay, thank you. Some people are going, really? Limited? Is blood limited? Yes, but the effectiveness of his blood having been shed, that, that in one sense, that's eternal. The benefits of him shedding his blood, well, that, 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 there's no bounds to that. But we don't drink his physical blood, but do we benefit from the fact that he shed his blood? We don't eat his physical body, do we? No. But do we benefit from the fact that his body was crushed for us? Yes, and so I think it's best to, there's an ellipsis going on here. He doesn't put all the words in. You know, you've got to kind of put some words in. He's talking about the, the benefits that come to us by virtue of Christ's shed, shed blood. The benefits that come to us through the Lord's Supper by virtue of Christ's broken body for us. I think that's what he's talking about there. So this would be, uh, this would be present communion with the living and exalted Lord of glory That occurs at the Lord's Supper. The communion here must be with the present benefits procured by His broken body and shed blood way back then. For His body is no longer broken, it is glorified, and His blood has finished its shedding. So he's talking about the benefits of His blood, the benefits of His body, and he says those things... We commune with those, we commune with Christ. That is, He brings those benefits to us at the Lord's Supper, doesn't He? You all know that, don't you? That's what He's doing. And He says, yeah, and and He assumes the answer is yes, and that they know that. And He says, now something, uh, not an exact one-to-one parallel relationship, granted, but something like that happens at these, these pagan things that you're going to, and you stop that. 
because you're messing around with stuff you shouldn't be messing around with. Now, it's interesting that this sharers in altar uh, and sharers in demons. You ever thought about that? What's this sharers in, altar, in the altar and sharers in demons down here in verses 18 and following? What does that mean? Look at the nation Israel, Paul says, according to the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? Now, what does sharers in the altar mean? Now, one thing that's very interesting here is that Paul uses a different word here than he does in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 for, uh, that he translate share, that's translated sharers here. Okay? It's, uh, it's a masculine form of koinonia, but it's not koinonia. Uh, the feminine form is a separate word. It's translated here sharers in the, alt- in the altar and sharers in demons, but it's not the exact same word for communion or participation that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, which, which tells me that whatever kind of sharing goes on over here with these altars in ancient Israel and these demons and, and the syncretistic uh, pagan religions that were going on in the first century, whatever that is, it's not the same exact kind of communion and sharing and participation we have in the body and blood of Christ. But there's an analogy. There's a parallel at some level, but not a one-to-one kind of relationship. Now, uh, that's all I'm going to say about that stuff, the altars and the demons, okay? I didn't come here to preach about demons. But Paul put it in his epistle. What is the point of the text as I try to wind down here? I have no idea what time I started. It was about 6 o'clock? Seems like it. It's 8.06. I should finish like about 10 minutes. Where's David? I can't see him. I'm blinded by these lights. What is the point of the text? Here's what I think the point is. Now I'll bring some practical conclusions. The point being made from this text is this. The bread and wine, which are are signs which signify present participation or present communion in the present benefits procured by Christ's body and blood. Grace procured by what Christ did for us becomes ours through the Lord's Supper. It is a means of grace, in other words. This is why, for instance, Spurgeon once said at this table, at the Lord's table, Jesus feeds us with his body and blood. See, Spurgeon could say that, and everybody says, wow, what a great sermon. If, if we said that, our people go, what are you, Roman Catholic? <laughs> right? No, we're Baptists, just like Spurgeon. We, we believe that uh, the Lord has ordained the supper as a means through which grace from heaven gets to souls on the earth. We believe it's more than a memory. Yeah, we remember his death, okay? But as we're doing that, the Spirit of God brings the benefits of redemption from the Christ of God to the sons of God on earth and nourishes us. The language of nourishment, that comes from our confession. It's because the confession formulated a doctrine of the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. So koinonia, fellowship, participation, communion of the blood and body of Christ means spiritual nourishment is brought to souls through the supper. It is present participation in the present benefits of Christ's death for those properly partaken. Taking. In other words, the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. And Paul brings up the nature of of the Lord's Supper as a means of grace in this text to argue against participating in pagan sacrificial meals, which is idolatry. Or as Charles Hodge asserts, it is here assumed that partaking of the Lord's Supper brings us into communion with Christ. If this be so, partaking of the table of demons must bring us into communion with demons. This is the Apostle's argument. So, even though this is a very difficult passage, I think it is very interesting that Paul assumes the supper as more than a memory here. If it was only a memorial meal, it it doesn't fit his argument that therefore you can't go to pagan uh, uh, ritual sacrificial meals. But if at the Lord's Supper something vertical happens, 
then, then his argument makes sense. There are certain aspects of paganism where something vertical happens. Not between, it's not, not God, okay? He says this. Um, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. But something's still going on with demons, okay? That's the vertical aspect of it. If the Lord's Supper was only horizontal memorial, this, you read this argument and go, this doesn't follow Paul. You need to go back to logic class. Or maybe this is a textual problem. We can tear it out or something. Okay, so it would only make sense if Paul assumes that the Corinthians knew that the Supper was a means of grace and more than a memory. Well, I do want to bring all this confusing stuff to uh, practical uh, considerations. And I have 27 of them. <laughs> but I only share seven. Because that is the perfect number. Or the number of perfection. First of all, communion or sharing in this text is not horizontal, but vertical. You already said that. I know I said that, but I'm going to say it again. Okay? It doesn't work if this communion here is horizontal. It doesn't fit the context and the argument. You can't draw the conclusions he does from it. But if it's vertical, if something's transpiring between heaven and the benefits of the blood and body of Christ are brought to earth to elect sinners on the earth who are partaking of this cup and bread then it makes sense. Second, and that's the shortest one, so don't get too encouraged. Second, since believers already have communion with Christ via faith, 1 Corinthians 1, nine, the Lord's Supper must be viewed as a means to nurture what is already possessed. Or as uh, Malcolm McLean asserts, this passage indicates that there is real fellowship between Christ and His people at the Supper. But it's not, he's not giving out saving, like initi uh, initial saving grace, justifi justification. People aren't repenting and believing uh, or, or getting eternal salvation just by virtue of taking the Supper. These people already have fellowship with God's Son, 1 Corinthians 1.9, but these people's fellowship is being enhanced. Okay, They're being refreshed. They're being nurtured and nourished by this supper. Third, though it is not a converting ordinance, the supper is a sanctifying ordinance. And it is like, in this sense, like the Word of God and prayer. It is a means through which grace comes to us from Christ. It is not a means of special grace. Okay? There's no like uh, sacramental Lord's Supper grace that's different, of a different quality than uh, the grace that we receive through the Word of God. It is not a means of special grace, but a special means of grace. Okay, it's a special means of grace. And who ordained it? Christ did. We read the passage, okay? The words of institution. And uh, who is the embodiment and the incarnation of the wisdom of God? Pastor Ron Baines, right? John Calvin, no man or woman, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if he ordained it, and he's the embodiment and the incarnation of wisdom, it, it should be good for us, right? It's a, it's a special means of grace, but it's not a means of special grace. Uh, listen to, to, to Bob Inc., somebody I quoted earlier, uh, or last night, there is not a single benefit of grace that withheld from us in the Word is now imparted to believers in a special way by the sacrament of the Supper. There is neither a separate baptismal grace nor a separate communion grace. The content of Word and Sacrament is completely identical. Okay? We, so we just get grace. We mean by that unmerited favor, the benefits of redemption which include justification, adoption, sanctification, everything involved with sanctification, spiritual vivification, uh, uh, power, help, assistance, encouragement, all that stuff. That's what we get through the means, grace. 
And the supper gives us the same kind of grace we might get through the Word. But it happens to be instituted by the Lord of glory. So it's therefore good for us. And, um, and we ought to um, obey the Lord in it. Fourth, through the Lord's Supper we receive something from Christ. The benefits of His body and blood. Through the Lord's Supper, we are served something from heaven. The benefits of His body and blood are brought to us at the supper, not by the pastors and not by the deacons. Again, Bavink says, He not only gave Himself for His own, He also gives Himself to His own. So who's the chief servant at the communion service? The Lord Jesus. That will change the way you look at the Lord's Supper. I'm going to get served grace by my Master. Didn't He always do everything He's going to do? Well, he, he, He accomplished redemption. But in the economy of God, in the outworking of God's purposes for salvation, the Father chose us, the Son Uh, accomplishes redemption and the Spirit of God applies it. One of the means He does that through, Christ sends His Spirit at the supper. I don't know, I don't, can't understand everything, okay? There's mystery involved, but I know this much. There's a vertical aspect at the Lord's Supper that happens that only God does and Christ is serving serving His people grace. The communion service. I think it used to be more looked upon that God was, God serves us. Grace. Instead of us, you know, serving God. And, and we do serve God as priests and offer Him up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable through Jesus Christ. Fifth, we ought to look at the supper as an event through which we receive and not only give. An event through which we receive and not only give. We are rendering the Lord our obedience, okay? So we're giving in that sense. But it's more of a sense of receiving. When you look at the Lord's Supper more as a giving thing on your part instead of a receiving thing, you know what happens? You say, well, I can't give the Lord anything good because I only read my Bible once this week. I'm not worthy to take the Lord's Supper. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 11. He doesn't say if you only read your Bible once this week, you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. They didn't have Bibles like us back then. They didn't read them probably at all because they didn't have them. Okay? They heard it spoken and they memorized it and things that maybe they had some you know, scrolls here and there that somebody copied, and they had little chunks of the Old Testament or whatever, but they didn't have Old and New Testaments like us. Like us. In 1 Corinthians 11, the people that weren't supposed to take the supper were people that had problems with brothers and sisters and ch- unresolved issues with people in the church. Okay? When you are like that, you shouldn't take the supper. Uh, when you're under the formal discipline of the church, you shouldn't take the supper. Is there any other conditions you can think of, any of the pastors, where you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper? What if, uh, what if you had a spat with your wife on Thursday night or Saturday night or on the way to church? I can't, I can't, I disagreed with my husband, I, I can't take the Lord's Supper. Uh, I didn't pray how I should have. Lord, forgive me, I can't take the Lord's Supper. You know, the, the supper, as somebody else said, it's not a reward for the strong. The re- a reward for, the, for a good week or a good month, depending on how often you take it. If we're in the new first century, I would say a reward for a good week because they took it every week. But it's another issue. Or it's not a reward for a good week. It is a means of grace, not for the weak. Or not for the strong, excuse me but for the weak. A lot of times, um, we do like individual excommunication. We do. Lord, I, I, I read my Bible this week, but I cheated. Because at the beginning of the year, I said, I'm going to read through the whole New Testament five times. That's 6.4 pages a day. And I only got 6.2 pages a day. So I cheated. Uh, I'm not going to take the supper this week. 
I don't, that's not at all what Paul meant. Okay? So what we do is we say, I'm going to inflict ch church discipline on myself and excommunicate myself from the supper. When you know what you need, just say, God, forgive me for all my sins. And you know what? I made some stupid resolves in January. I probably shouldn't have done that, but I made them. Please forgive me of that as well. I need grace. I'm going to take the supper. There was a lady a long time ago, uh, the Scottish Presbyterians, and I don't know how often this one session or church um, took the supper, but this, there was one lady that one of the elders, presiding ministers that was serving, um, knew this lady personally, and he saw her in line as, as she was coming up to take uh, the communion elements, and she was trembling, and she was actually crying, weeping. And uh, he, when she came up there, since he knew her, he says, woman, take, it's for sinners. And a burden was left, you know, just left her soul. It's for sinners in need of more grace, Okay. It's not for the elite saints only, like some of the Corinthians apparently thought it was. Read chapter 11. There's a horizontal issue there. They had major problems, okay? It's for people who are like us, like that pitifully weak preacher that was testifying uh, earlier today. I'm like him. I'm worse than him. And if you know yourself right, rightly, you'll say, I'm worse than you. And we're, if we're going to fight, we'll fight about who's the worst. And that, then I can trump you all and say, Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Then we'll fight about who... I'm second. And if you really know yourself, you know. And so you, what you could do is, a pastor could lead a congregation this way. We're going to have Holy Communion. Oh, and the mood music, mood music, you know, is there. You need to look deep into your soul. If you've been unfaithful to the Lord, don't! Bring the wrath of God upon your soul or this congregation. You know, you could do that. You could say, I wouldn't like to be at a church like that, by the way. Do you do that? Don't do that. John's going to do it sometimes. Depends on who's there. No, no it doesn't. I'm sure he doesn't do that. Okay? I think the climate at the Lord's Supper, I'm off the notes. But if you know it's early. Oh, I got like 30 minutes, 25 minutes. The climate at the Lord's Supper shouldn't be like a, a Protestant uh, funeral procession. Like somebody died and is dead, and there's nothing good about the death. Well, somebody did die. But guess what happened? He was rewarded for his obedience for us, and he was raised from the dead. And guess what else happened? All this fullness of messianic grace and blessing was ascended into heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father. Guess what else happened? He commissioned the Spirit to bring that, those blessings to souls. How did He do that? Through means. What's one of the means? The supper. Wow, we get grace during the supper. I think it should be more of a, uh, not jovial, okay? But, but a joyful and festive occasion. We should look forward to the supper because it is a means of grace and uh, 26 of my 27 here, where am I? Number five. We have to look at the supper as an event through which we receive and not only give. That which we receive is a top-down gift from heaven to earth from our glorified Redeemer to us, brought to us, as I said last night, by the Holy Spirit through the symbols utilized at our communion services where we are served by the Lord Jesus the benefits of His redemption. Sixth, if the Lord's Supper is a means of grace, then we ought to take it regularly and often. Most churches here probably take the uh, Supper maybe once a month. I'm not sure. Our church takes it, uh, takes it uh, as often as we can, uh, which most of the time means weekly. And I'm not here to argue one way or the other, but I do know this much. Regularly, you, you should not excuse yourself from the supper. Oh, it's only the Lord's Supper tonight. It's only the Lord's Supper? Jesus instituted it for your soul's well-being. I need to grow in grace. Well, then use the means of grace, you know. Get your tails to the supper. It's <laughs> a nice way of saying it. If you want the, what I really wanted to say, I can tell you about that later. 
You know, it's really weird. Should we have to tell people? You need to get your... You know, why, why does your pastor sometimes... He probably does, has before, encourage you. You know, I, I, I'm not seeing you at evening service. Or I haven't seen you at the Lord's Supper. Or uh, missed you at church the last couple weeks. You think he likes, you know, being a, a, the policeman like that? And follow, you think he's next... What's the next step? You're going to follow me around town now? No, he wants your soul now to prosper, and he wants you to present you as mature as he can uh, to Christ on the last day. He loves you. That's why he wants you to church, at church. Because what happens when people go to church more regularly? What happens? You grow. <laughs> why? Because you're sticking your souls in, in, in the, under the means of grace, okay? And you're going to benefit over time, especially over time. You're going to have peaks and valleys, okay? It's not like if you go to church, you're just you're floating, like Pastor Bain said. Nobody floats, okay? And people think, you know that song, ba ba bubbling." You ever heard that song, that camp song, ba ba bubbling, ba ba bubbling"? And I think it meant I'm just walking like six inches off the ground. I got a halo, I got wings, and it's just great being a Christian. There's nothing wrong. It's glorious. It's they over eschatologize the uh, Christian life. The Christian life is hard, okay? We need help. We're all messed up. Okay? We're all up on blocks being repaired. And the means of grace help us grow and nurture, uh, be nurtured. Now, if the Lord's Supper... I already said this. This is number seven. The Lord's Supper should not be viewed for the strong as only a reward for the strong, but as a means of grace for the weak. Um, in chapter 32, uh, chapter 30, excuse me, of, of the, uh, our confession of faith in paragraph 1, listen to this. The Supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by him the same night wherein he was betrayed to be observed in his churches and to the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance and showing forth the sacrifice of himself and his death, confirmation of the faith of believers in all the benefits thereof, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe to him and to be a bond and pledge for their communion with him and with each other, okay, vertical and horizontal. But here we have the language of nourishment, okay? We need nourishment for our bodies, and we eat food. We need nourishment for our souls. We get that through the means of grace. And the Lord's Supper is one of those means. And if you want to know more about the altars and the demons and all that stuff, you can, um, you can read some commentaries. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, I know I marvel at what Paul assumed without even stating, though I think it's stated in the words he uses and understood certainly in the context. He just assumed that these Corinthians knew that more happened at the Lord's Supper than simply something that goes from side to side, a horizontal sharing. But because something more than that was happening... Uh, he uses that to say, flee idolatry. Get away from that, those pagan um, meals and rituals. We thank you that we have this knowledge revealed to us in the scriptures and pray that you would help us to understand the blessings that the supper brings to us, certainly recalling and doing this together, recalling the fact that Jesus died, shed his blood, his body was crushed for us. Wonderful, redemptive, uh, memorial concepts there. That the word, Spirit of God blesses. That's the Word of God coming as a means. But also, uh, mysteriously, uh, when we partake of these symbols, there is transference of grace from heaven to earth. And we bow down to the mystery 
and thank you for the effect in our souls. And we thank you for this time tonight in Jesus' name.